Morning, friends. This is Brother Sam Gerhard, and I'm sitting here at the place that we're able to stay until we can occupy the place that we're buying up here at the Big South Fork. And uh, being Sunday morning and uh, getting this ministry started the first Sunday of, of uh, 2021, I wanted to take a few minutes and spend some time in our Bibles and share something with you. As we get settled and get the internet hooked up at our place, we will uh, be able to do Facebook Live and and uh, hopefully that'll be able to take place in the not too distant future. But in the meantime, on Sunday mornings, I'll do something similar to what I'm doing now and uh, I'll record a little something and and then uh, and then just share that video uh, a little later in the day when I get to a place where there's enough phone service to get it posted. Well. As you will learn, there will be two things that uh, I'll talk about in this ministry a whole lot. One is the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel that saves today. Nothing else matters if an individual, man, woman, boy, or girl, have, has never trusted the gospel of Christ, the finished work of Christ for their eternal salvation. Nothing else matters. So we'll concentrate always on the gospel. Uh, there will rarely be a message, if ever, uh, that I won't present the gospel. And we'll do that here today. And then we talk about uh, the rightly divided word of truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3 and 4 says, God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so there's the gospel which is a one-time event. There's salvation, I should say, which is a one-time event. It's an instantaneous event. The, one, the moment one believes they're a sinner, can't save themselves, and they trust that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and was raised again for their justification. In other words, they just simply trust the finished work of Christ, knowing that they have no hope or no help if they try to do something in their own efforts, religious or not, to save themselves. And knowing that they can't save themselves, they trust the finished work of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection for their salvation. That's uh, God our Savior who will have all men to be saved. That's the only way to be saved in this present dispensation is simply trusting what Christ did. Hear the gospel, believe the gospel, and then trust the gospel of Christ. Trust what Christ did for your, on your behalf for your salvation. And then to, uh, to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now that's uh, that's a lifelong uh, event. That's something that carries on. Uh, like I said, salvation is a is an instantaneous event, but uh, coming unto the knowledge of the truth that's a lifelong event, and it takes studying your Bible. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me focus on what I wanted to focus on today, and hopefully I won't be too very long. And I've got a comfortable place here and uh, uh, hopefully a, a pleasant scene. Uh, but let's get into the Word for just a few minutes. And uh, uh, I'm going to take you to Acts chapter 20. Uh, the last message I preached at the ministry that I left there in Newport, Tennessee, the Bible Believers Cowboy Church, I used this same text. And, uh, of course, I focused on one part of this passage more so with them. Uh, today, I'll focus on another part of this passage, but let's begin reading here. Uh, Paul is finishing, well, let me give the scenario. Paul is finishing his uh, third missionary journey. He's on his way from uh, uh, where he's been. He's on his way where he knows he's headed to Jerusalem. Of course, if you know anything about your Bible, in Acts 21, it's where Paul is arrested. Uh, we're right here, time-wise, we're right here, A.D. 59, A.D. 60, which means it's going to be, uh, uh, Paul's got another seven, eight, nine years. Uh, it's, he was beheaded uh, in uh, 67, 68, something like that. So he's got seven, eight, nine years left of his life and left of his ministry. And so as he's passing through on his way, headed to Jerusalem, uh, here's what we read. I'm going to begin at verse 16 of uh, Acts chapter 20. Bear with me while we read. 
Uh, and by the way, I always read and believe and use the King James Bible. Uh, if that uh, puts you off, please don't let it. If you stay with the ministry and continue on over the course of time, you'll understand why I use and believe that the King James Bible is the preserved Word of God without error. But like I said, don't let that throw you off. Listen to the message here. And so Acts chapter 20, verse 16. Get where I can read and see in my eyes here. It says, For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus, because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Now remember, Paul had spent three years uh, in Ephesus, had uh, invested a good bit of time in Ephesus and uh, preaching the gospel of Christ there. And so we continue on. Uh, verse 18, And when they, that would have been the elders of the church at Ephesus, and when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22 now of Acts 20. Paul says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know that... Uh, this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And also, excuse me, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking first things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every, uh, every, uh, let me get where I can see here, excuse me. Verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more, and they accompanied him into the ship. Now, like I said, I shared this uh, the last Sunday that I was with the Cowboy Church Ministry there in Newport. And of course, I focused on Paul's admonition and instructions and his encouragement to them as he was leaving and uh, telling him that he would see their face no more. Now, I hope I see those folks' face in Newport again at some point. I hope they invite me back to preach a message at a Bible conference or, or something like that or passing through. I hope they come up here and some of them trail ride with us. I hope they'll come up here and trail ride with us. So, so it's not the same sense where I'll not see them anymore. Uh, but uh, I was leaving there and coming up here. 
And so it was kind of that final message. And while I hit on this, I'm going to go back to these couple of verses, and here's what I want to focus on today, because Paul says, I'm, I'm leaving you, and I'm not going to be here, but I'm going somewhere else because I have something to accomplish there. And that's kind of where uh, I'm at in my ministry here. And so uh, we've left there, but now we've come here, and uh, we have a ministry here. Uh, a man has a ministry, and wherever he goes, he's to be uh, about that ministry that God's given him. Well, the ministry God's given me is to preach the gospel of the grace of God and the rightly divided word of truth. I'm a gospel preacher and a Bible teacher, and that's what I want to do and tend to do here. And I hope we'll find a few folks who will hear the gospel, trust Christ, and be saved, and then uh, grow in knowledge and understanding of the word of God. I hope we'll find some folks who have been saved, who have a hunger and a desire to know the word of God, that they might come and participate in our Bible studies. Uh, but let's focus back here in Acts chapter 20. We're going to start back here again at verse uh, 22, 23, and 24. And again, a lot of stuff here. If you come and become a regular part of our Bible studies, we'll eventually talk about the, uh, the, the, the depth of what these passages mean. Today, I'm just hitting some highlights and more making an application. But Paul says here in Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Now when Paul says he goes bound in the Spirit, if you'll notice, it's a little s in that word. And so that's Paul's own spirit. Paul was bound in his spirit. He was determined in his own heart and mind to go to Jerusalem. Uh, circumstances of his life and the direction of his life and the leading of his life was taking him to go to Jerusalem and conduct a ministry there. He is now finished up three missionary journeys. Uh, he's gone to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And he's got a ministry he wants to accomplish in Jerusalem. And, uh, of course, I think that he has some uh, foresight there. And he, I think he kind of anticipates what's going to happen to him. But he says he, he's, he's bound in, his spirit, in the spirit to go into Jerusalem. Well, I, I was put in a situation of life where I had to make some decisions. And it seems like every major move of my life, it's been like that. Some circumstance of life, some event beyond my control oftentimes has compelled me, okay, uh, my wife and I, we've got to make a decision. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? What are we going to, uh, how are we going to carry on from this point to the next point? And so that's kind of what compelled us. And so we reached a stage of life. I'm 63 years old now. And well, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? We need this and we need this in order to carry on. Well, all those things of needing this, needing that, were met by making this move to Big South Fork. And so I was compelled, I was bound in my spirit uh, to come to Big South Fork, as Paul was bound in his spirit to go to Jerusalem. And as Paul said there in verse 22, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Well, that's, that's true any time you make a move. You don't know the things that are going to happen once you get there. You just trust God and you make the move and you step out on faith and you just move forward and, and you just do what you can do, when you can do it, where you can do it, and how you can do it. And that's kind of where we are. And so, uh, so we've been bound in the Spirit to come to Big South Fork, just like Paul was bound in the Spirit there to go to Jerusalem. His own Spirit, not the Spirit of God. I can't tell you God led me to this place, but I can tell you the circumstances of life put me in a position that in my own heart, mind, and spirit, and my wife's own heart, mind, and spirit, we wanted to come to Big South Fork. And I guess I'd say that anybody that's known us for any length of time, I can't imagine that they haven't looked at each other somewhere along the way and said, you know, one day Sam and Debbie will be up at Big South Fork and they'll move up there. Well, here we are. Praise the Lord. Glory. Hallelujah. All right. So he goes on verse 23. Uh, ending verse 22 again, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Abide me. Well, I'm not going to go into all that. That's about Paul and his ministry and so on. And, and uh, uh, again, uh, and I just will make this little application. Anytime you move into a place and you preach the gospel and you preach that it's all about Jesus and it's nothing about the flesh, uh, you're going to find resistance there. Uh, the religious crowd, they want you to make a fair show of the flesh. They want to tell you, you've got to do something to earn your salvation, or you've got to do something to keep your salvation. And as we continue to preach and teach the Word of God, I believe I can show you plainly from the words on the page in Scripture that's written to, for, and about you, 
that you don't have to do anything to earn your salvation. You cannot do anything to earn your salvation. Uh, Jesus did it all. All you do is trust what Christ did. And if anybody tells you you've got to add something to that in order to attain or to uh, maintain your salvation, they don't understand the gospel. They don't understand the gospel of the grace of God. They don't understand the dispensation of the grace of God. And ultimately, they don't understand their Bibles. I don't care how nice their suit is or uh, how often they go to the church house or how beautifully they sing the hymns or, or, or how loud they shout and run the aisles. I don't care about all that. Uh, if you don't know the gospel and it's all about what Jesus did, nothing about what you do, and you add something to that gospel and tell a person they've got to do something to get saved or besides believe and trust Christ or they've got to do something to stay saved besides simply rest in the grace of God, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care who they are, how religious they are, how clean living they are, uh, they don't understand what God's doing today, and they may even be lost themselves. Well, there's that. All right, carry on, Sam. I'm going to lose folks before you even get started. Now, verse 24. He says, but none of these things move me. He said, uh, I'm bound in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. I know there can be problems. I know there can be difficulties. I know things can happen. Uh, that's nothing new to me, Paul says. And I guess I would say the same thing. I know things can happen. I know difficulties can come. But you know what? That's okay. I've said for many, many years, life is not a bump in the road. <laughs> life is a bumpy road. And that's just a fact. All right, so now verse 24 again, he says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Paul has a course. He has a, he has a direction. He has something he knows he needs to accomplish. Uh, when we read back over here, I think I got it marked back over here in uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I'm here, so let me go ahead and talk about it. Paul says in Acts 20, verse 24, uh, that he's not moved. He doesn't count his life dear unto himself. He wants to finish his course with joy. And then we get over here, uh, uh, you know, six, seven, eight years later, uh, and he's writing the last book of Scripture uh, to Timothy in the book of 2 Timothy. And he says here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and he says, uh, we're beginning at verse 6. For he's, so he says, he's right here on the threshold. He's fixing to lose his head. And so he says, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. And he doesn't mean leaving Rome or leaving prison. He means leaving this life and going to the next. He knows he's fixing to die. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 6 again. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He goes on, verse 8, and says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. But again, focus on verse 7. I have fought a good, we're asked, or excuse me, 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I want to be able to say that at the end of my life. But Paul says here in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy. And uh, indeed, I believe he did. He finished his course with joy. He did everything God wanted him to do. And when he accomplished everything God wanted him to do, he had fought that good fight. He would finished the course. He kept the faith. And he was headed for glory. All right. He goes on and says, So that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. The ministry that Paul had received of the Lord Jesus. Paul had a ministry that he received of the Lord Jesus. God had a ministry for Paul. Paul completed that ministry. And as you stay with us and you come to these Bible studies, whether through Facebook uh, Live or whether through the video posting of, a, a, you know, uh, like I'm doing today, or whether you actually come in person once we get a location and a place we can meet on a regular basis, uh, you'll learn more about the, more and more about this ministry that Paul received of the Lord Jesus. And he goes on here in this place and he says this ministry to testify the gospel of the grace of God. To testify the gospel 
of the grace of God. And folks, that's what I want to do. I want to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So go with me for a couple of places because I want to clearly give you that gospel of the grace of God. Paul was saved on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 by the grace of God. Uh, Paul was the first man saved solely and completely by the grace of God. Now, don't let that turn you off. That doesn't mean there wasn't other saved folks out there before Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, but, Paul, but Saul of Tarsus was saved by the grace of God. You'll have to come to the Bible studies to understand, well, why was Saul's salvation any different than anybody else's? Well, I can't chase that rabbit today. Don't have time. You'll have to come to the Bible studies to learn. But Saul was saved by the grace of God. And Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul, our apostle, uh, the, the apostle to the Gentiles. That's who most of you and I are. Uh, there may happen to be a few Jews out there listening, but most of us listening are, are Gentiles here. And so Paul's the apostle of the Gentile. He's saved by the gospel of Christ and the gospel of the grace of God. And as Paul continues on and God prepares him, uh, then he starts his missionary journeys in Acts chapter 13, and he's preaching the gospel of Christ. He's preaching that, uh, well, let's just find it. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Or, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I, I, let's make the main thing the main thing. Paul says in Acts 20, 24, he wants to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And so Saul of Tarsus saved on the road to Damascus. He goes to, uh, to, to Bible school, so to speak. Uh, God begins to give him an, uh, 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 an education. He begins to receive uh, revelations from Jesus Christ, uh, information that nobody else had ever been given. Now, I know some of this sounds foreign, uh, but you come to our Bible studies and you'll, you'll learn. You'll see it's right there in black and white in the old King James Bible. And uh, so Paul begins his ministry in Acts 13, going to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so he would travel. He would hit those cities. He would go to the synagogues. He would preach to those Jews there. He would preach to whatever Gentiles was there. And uh, as he would go, he would first preach to them that Jesus was the Son of God, what's called the Gospel of God. You find that in Romans chapter 1. Don't have time to chase that down today, but you can find it over in the first few verses of Romans 1. And... Uh, and so the gospel of God is just simply the historical fact that Jesus was the Son of God, was crucified on a cross, died, was buried, and rose again. Well, then he tells us in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so at that time, in that place in history, in that place of the human culture, in that part of the world, uh, Paul's ministry was first to convince folks that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed the promised and prophesied Messiah of Israel, that he was in fact the Son of God. That's the gospel of God. And then as though folks would believe the gospel of God, he would take them over and preach to them then the gospel of Christ. And we find the gospel of Christ plainly spelled out without, this, without any confusion in 1 Corinthians, yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. I'm going to try to move along pretty quickly, not get bogged down too bad, but uh, but I want you to understand the gospel. Paul says, I want to go testify. Uh, I want to finish my course with joy, and uh, and I, I want and, and the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Well, we need to know what that is. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, here's the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. I ask folks all the time, show me in the Bible where is the gospel. And they can't do it. They'll try to maybe take me to John 3.16, but hold your horses, grab your saddle horn. John 3.16 is not the gospel. It's not the gospel for us today. If you don't know the gospel, you don't have any... I mean, you got to know the gospel to make any kind of even application of John 3.16. And so we're trying to get back here to the gospel, Sam. Don't chase rabbits and get folks confused. Just stay with me. I ask folks, where do you find the gospel that saves you today? The gospel of your salvation? And uh, they can't tell me. Well, if you're listening and you'll pay attention and you're making any notes, uh, after today, you'll be able to tell folks, here's where you find the gospel. Because Paul tells us plainly, here's the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Now, can it be any plainer than that? And Paul says, which I received, which I preached unto you. Here's the gospel that I preached unto you, which also ye have received, 
So Paul, here's the gospel. Paul said, it's the gospel I preach to you. It's the gospel that you received. In other words, they heard it, they believed it, and then they trusted it, the gospel. And he goes on and says, and wherein ye stand. You stand in that gospel. Verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. And don't let that confuse you. That's just simply saying, if you remember what I preached, he's not putting a condition on the thing. He's just saying, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. If you remember what I preached, you know this is the gospel by which you're saved. And he goes on to say, unless you have believed in vain. Now, that throws people off and bucks people off the horse too sometimes because, well, what about this believing in vain? Well, if you continue reading 1 Corinthians 15, it's all about the resurrection. And uh, Paul says plainly as you keep reading 1 Corinthians 15 that if Christ didn't raise from the dead, we're yet in our sins, our faith is vain. So you see, it's all about the resurrection of Christ there. And so he says, unless you have believed in vain. Now, verse 3 and 4, here's the Here's the cliff notes, the thumbnail, the core of the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Remember he set up verse, verse 1, that gospel which ye have received. Now he's down here in verse 3. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Paul received the gospel of Christ that saves today. And he preached to those folks there at Corinth the gospel of Christ that saves today. I'm preaching to you today the gospel of Christ that saves today. And he goes on then and says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, and now he gives it. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Then he begins to go on through there and talk about the resurrection and uh, in Adam all die and Christ are all made alive. I encourage you to go ahead and read 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter this afternoon. But there's the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Now you go back over here to uh, Romans chapter 3. Let me give you a quick outline of the book of Romans. I hope you're still with me. Quick outline of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, 2, and on into chapter 3 tells us that all men are sinners. Romans is foundational doctrine for the church, the body of Christ. So Romans chapter 1, 2, and on into chapter 3 uh, says we're all sinners. And then you pick up with chapter 3, 4, and 5, and it says, well, here's how sinners can be saved. And then it goes into Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, and it says, then these sinners who are saved are now secure in Christ. Romans 6, 7, and 8. And then he puts a little parenthetical passage in there, Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, and he explains what about Israel, because Israel is being set aside as God now focusing on the church, the body of Christ. And so he answers that question there. Well, what about Israel? What about the seed? Or what about the Semites? Try to keep my alliteration. And so that's chapter 9, 10, and 11. And then you pick up chapter 12 through 16, the rest of the rest of the book. And it's, well, in light of all men are sinners, but all men can be saved if they'll trust the gospel. And those saved men, those sinners who are saved by trusting the gospel are secure in Christ. And then skip over this thing about what's going on with Israel, 9, 10, 11, and then come in and say, okay, now that we know that sinners are saved and secure, well, what is it? What about their life? Well, then we get Christian service and how to live your life in Romans chapter 12 through 16. And then he finishes up chapter 16, how to be established or stabilized or fixed in place. There's the outline of the book of Romans. Well, that's a lot of information. I want to come back and focus again on the, the, the gospel of Christ. Uh, to testify the gospel of Christ. When you get to Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5, and I want to spend just a minute here with this. I hope you don't believe me. Stay with me. That's the great thing about these videos. If if you need to, you can stop and pause and go get your cup of coffee, which, by the way, and then you can come back and finish up and listen to them later. But we get here in Romans chapter 4. Paul's talking about the faith of Abram, Abraham. Abraham, it says there in Romans chapter 4, verse 1, 
or excuse me, Romans chapter 4, verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So then he goes down through here, and he talks about Abram believing God, and God counted it to him for righteousness. Abram, God spoke to Abram way back there in Genesis chapter 12. God made promises to Abram. Abram believed God, and God counted Abram's faith and what God told him for righteousness. God imputed righteousness to Abram because Abram took God at his word. Now you come down through here, the rest of Romans chapter 4, and you get to the end of the chapter, and, uh, and we're going to begin reading at verse 25. A lot of scripture. I want you to know we're, we're basing what we're telling you on scripture. So Romans chapter 4 verse 25. Now it was not written for his sake alone. So all this about Abram and that we're reading in Romans 4 and all that we read about Abram and back there beginning at Genesis 12 on through 18, 19, 20 in there. All that was not written for his sake or Abram, Abraham's sake alone. So now it was not written for his sake alone that it was it, righteousness, was imputed to him, Abram. So all this about Abram, Abraham was not written just to record the story of Abram or Abraham. But it was written for us also, to whom it, righteousness, shall be imputed. So just like righteousness was imputed to Abram because he believed God and simply took God at his word and trusted what God told him by faith, so also you and I can have the same faith of Abram when we believe God, take God's word for us and to us and, and believe what God told us for our salvation that we might also receive the imputed righteousness of Christ. So again, now verse 23 again. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it, righteousness, was imputed to him, Abram. Now verse 24. But for us also, to whom it, the righteousness of Christ, shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You see, there's that gospel again. Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now continue with me on into chapter 5. I hope you don't get bored with the reading and the studying of the Word of God. So Romans chapter 5 now, he continues on. Therefore, being justified by faith, not by faith plus, just by faith. Therefore, being justified by faith. Faith in what? Abram was justified by faith in what God told him. Well, we're justified by faith in what God tells us. Well, what does God tell us today? That Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses, was, raised, was, was buried, and was raised again for our justification. So we're justified by faith. He says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. What a wonderful thing. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not through what we've done, not through any religious activity, not through any change of life, not for any uh, doing the do's and don'ting the don'ts, but we have peace with God simply through our Lord Jesus Christ when we simply, by faith, believe and trust the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and was raised again the third day for our justification. Now verse 2 of Romans 5. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And so we continue on through there. I'm going to drop down here verse 8, my favorite passage of Scripture. Romans chapter 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved through faith or from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And I, and not only, uh, and not, get where I can read it, I'm sorry. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. Well, I've been on here long enough. Folks, I want you to hear the gospel of the grace of God. I'm here to testify the gospel of the grace of God. 
Now, as we would continue on, we could go to Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm not going to take time because I, I haven't paid the time how long I've been on here, but I've probably been on here long enough. But uh, Ephesians chapter 3, in, in Acts 20, Paul talks about the gospel of the grace of God. You get over there in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul talks about the dispensation of the grace of God. And so the gospel of the grace of God is what's being preached in the dispensation of the grace of God. That gospel of the grace of God is the same as the gospel of Christ. And the gospel of Christ was preached back there and through the book of Acts to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And as Paul's leaving uh, that third missionary journey and he's headed to Jerusalem, he's got a job to do. He's got a course to finish. And that job to do and that course to finish is to take the gospel to Gentiles like you and me. Pagan, idolatrous, wicked, no promises, no connection to Israel, uh, just lost, undone, outside any covenants of promise, the Gentiles. And as Paul gets arrested and he carries on, he ends up in that Romans chapter, in that prison, that Roman prison in Acts chapter 8. And then he begins to write those books from that prison and that third missionary journey, or that, excuse me, that fourth journey, and then he gets rearrested before he loses his life. He begins writing those, uh, what we call prison epistles, post-Acts epistles, those post-Acts letters. And, uh, and in those, he's really explained the gospel of Christ and the dispensation, the gospel of the grace of God and the dispensation of the grace of God. Well, again, don't let me confuse you all that. Just be coming to our Bible studies. But I want you to understand the gospel of the grace of God, and let me put it in a, in a bag and finish it up so we can say amen and be done with our day here and or carry on with our day. And that's this. The gospel of the grace of God is the same content of the gospel of Christ. Romans 1.16 Romans 3, 4, and 5, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, many other places. The gospel of Christ is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and raised again for our justification. The gospel of the grace of God is that you and I, with no promises, no past identification, no past, uh, you know, you can't go find us with any promises in Israel and all that, just pagan Gentile dogs that we can have a relationship with the Almighty, Holy, God Almighty through the finished work of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we realize and when we realize we're sinners, we can't save ourselves and we place our trust in the fact that Christ, the sinless Son of God, died for our sins on Calvary's cross, died that bloody death. He was buried and took all of those sins to the depths of hell and left them there. And God the Father was satisfied with the sacrifice of his son and he brought his son out by the power of the Holy Spirit, resurrected him. And because of that resurrection, we can be justified simply by faith. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised again the third day for our justification. And the gospel of the grace of God that I want to testify of, the gospel of the grace of God that Paul testified of, is that you can be saved by grace without any effort of your own. One more passage and I'm done. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Paul says to the folks at Ephesus, For by grace, grace alone, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves... You can't do anything to earn your salvation. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Folks, I want you to receive the gift of God. How do you receive a gift? You just take it. The gift is offered to you. We just went through the Christmas season. Somebody pulled out a box or a package, had your name on it. To Billy Bob from... Granny and Papa, that box was provided and prepared for you. And somebody picks that box up and it's wrapped up all pretty, maybe has a bow on it and they extend it out to you. And they say, here's a gift for you. You didn't earn that gift. They give it out of love. And you can't get that gift unless you receive it. You take it. You open that gift up. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast.
My folks, I, folks, I pray that you've heard the gospel of the grace of God. I pray that I've effectively testified the gospel of the grace of God. And I pray that if you've never been saved, that you will today trust Christ and the gospel of the grace of God for your eternal salvation. Well, stay in touch with us here through the Bible Believers Cowboy Ministries uh, Facebook page here. And uh, we'll continue to share the gospel and uh, look forward to your feedback and uh, look forward to finding a place that we can meet face to face. God bless. Have a wonderful day.